Okay, since it's uh, 9 a.m., I think I will start. Welcome for this session about supercomputing or monitoring of supercomputing, supercomputers. Um, the agenda reads as follows. First, I will start with a couple of sentences about me, then uh, talk a little bit about the origin of HPC on a few slides, then what we see today, and what are the future <coughs> challenges in uh, monitoring and maintaining supercomputers. And at the end there is a Q&A, and uh, I hope since it's a birth of the feather session that we have an extensive uh, Q&A session, so don't be shy and don't hesitate to ask questions. Um, yeah. And if there is time at the end, I might uh, can give you a little tool demo um, of a tool that I will show as well. So my name is Christian Kniep. I work for Bull in uh, R&D for HPC, the HPC software stack. So I'm, maybe some of you were attending last year, but the feather session I gave about InfiniBand monitoring. The title was Problems, or InfiniBand Problems, Do You Care? So it was, uh, or it, it came to that I, that I um, was two years involved in maintaining an InfiniBand cluster, a fairly large one with 4,000 nodes. And this leads to uh, an InfiniBand monitoring tool I was writing and, um, and involving it to my bachelor thesis. So um, I presented this and question which were raised in terms of InfiniBand monitoring last year. And this year I would like to broaden the scope a bit and um, not only talk about InfiniBand monitoring, but supercomputer monitoring in general and what the pitfalls are and what we might do about it. But first, a little bit about the HPC origins, the, where we came from. The first uh, supercomputer, or what you could call a supercomputer, is uh, the CDC 6600. It um, was, a, for his time, a very fast supercomputer. It takes the current IBM and its age by a, a big factor. Cray took this off and uh, developed the Cray-1, which uh, leads, or the, this technology architecture leads uh, the last, or the, the next 10 years, 15 years. It, uh, the vector ruled through the, eight, uh, the 70s and uh, the early 80s, let's say, and the uh, numeric wind tunnel was uh, built in the early 90s. And uh, so it's not dead yet, let's say. But, um, and there were even, uh, I uh, would say, in, in appearance, uh, weirder ideas. So the CM1 um, was a bit serial computer with uh, over 60,000 processors. So uh, in this stage, it was not clear which technology will, will uh, lead to the next barrier. The handling. So I'm, no, I'm just uh, reached 30, so uh, I could not say on my, out of my experience, but uh, as far as I, as I talked to people and as far as I understood it was uh, close to mastering the US was uh, the thing in this area because it was a very close system, so you have to master the operating system because there all the bits and pieces um, underneath are not that obvious to you. And um, it was also that the system experience was the key, let's say. So if you have a system, you work with it for a couple of years, then you had experience in this, and this leads to, to you become a better system operator or a system of administrator. And there were no middleware to master because there were no middle to bridge. So there were not the distributed systems where you have uh, uh, many, many nodes, or it was, as I said, it was, um, a brick, a big, big piece that you can uh, dig on. It's not that you have uh, a lot of moving pieces. And it was not as, as widely spread as the supercomputers of today. So, um, if you if you think of this age, you you were if if, it's, if you were a student, you maybe you you could consider yourself lucky if your university has a supercomputer like the CDC six thousand six hundred or uh, something else. But uh, it was not likely that you, you might uh, 
could uh, get your hands on this machine. So the lack of systems were also a big issue. Today, we uh, start with the uh, early 80s, the prototype of Intel, the touchdown delta in uh, 92, was the first computer um, built of 32-bit uh, RISC processors. Uh, but as I said, it was a prototype. It was the only system built by Intel. And the article of the Popular Science, this one is from March 1992, if you uh, add zeros to the measurements they took for memory and for not teraflop, but today's exaflop, so if you add some zeros to the measurements, it uh, could be a place today. So it was a very nice read. You can find it on Google Books, books and uh, it's a yeah, nice one. In 1997, the ASCII-RED um, tear down the, one, uh, the teraflop barrier with 1.2 teraflop. It was built uh, out of Pentium Pros with 200 <coughs> megahertz. And this was the first cluster that outperforms uh, the old machines. And uh, another system to mention, I think, not only because it's a very beautiful picture, I think, it's the Mare Nostrum of the Barcelona Supercomputing Center. It's uh, uh, an IBM machine, but it was run with the SUSE Linux, so the first one with real commodity software, let's say. And this is where we are today. So we have commodity, uh, commodity architecture. Um, normally, the, the boxes on the left, uh, which are 1U or 2U uh, systems. And um, we are mostly on the same hardware stack. Some things uh, might differ between the vendors. For instance, Bull, um, it's my employer, uh, uses uh, sophisticated cooling mechanism with uh, direct liquid cooling and um, this is what, what, are, what, are, what differs but the architecture is basically the same. But that's for the history um, or the hardware history let's say. What today uh, is a problem is the complexity so as we have one big machine in the early days nowadays we have layers of different uh, or layers on top of the hardware. First, uh, we have the BMC or the uh, integrated lights out, light out um, management that enables us to alter or measure information of the hardware. And of course, we, we have Linux or some Unix flavor on top of it. And we use uh, Interconnect as I'm used to InfiniBand, I put InfiniBand here, but it could be 10 gig E or the uh, proprietary things that, that came up as well. Then we had some bash script that uh, might use OpenFOAM or some, some, some other application to, to tackle the problem. And this could be orchestrated by a workload manager like Slurm, for instance. And if you are lucky, then your user script will include the returns codes or something that you can handle. So if not, then the complexity will even break, I think. So you have to, to or let's switch to the next slide. Everything is interconnected for sure. So um, if you have a problem in open foam and this uh, <coughs> is included through InfiniBand, then you, it's not easy, let's say, to uh, handle these problems properly. And like I said last year, uh, InfiniBand problems are mostly in a context and um, it's mo introduced by a certain user script that uses uh, IPv6 or some other problem, or some other um, software layers. And, and this is hard to tackle if you um, only s look at the InfiniBand side or the InfiniBand logs and then you have to note down what uh, timestamp you see this error and then you get down to the other layers and then you try to extract information which layer in which time has which problems and then you have to compare it and this is very very hard uh, to to connect and if you're an academic side or uh, then you have maybe more time or more resources to do this but if you are in the uh, commercial business, uh, I was working for Daimler. Um, they 
are doing or the commercial side is mostly doing best effort support so you don't can dig into the problem as long as you like uh, because someone says okay we don't see the error for one week so don't care about it now we will cross the bridge again then when we when we see it so to speak so that's uh, the complexity is a problem and services as well so you have many services like NTP service to uh, distribute the timestamp which without which you don't even can compare the different layers because if uh, one server has uh, uh, the current timestamp and another it differs for 30 seconds or 45 seconds or even four seconds uh, it will be in close to impossible to connect the dots that you might have on your notepad because the times are not uh, right and accurate so this is, uh, is a big issue and there are other services as well LDAP or uh, or NFS or uh, yeah, all the service you can count and they are interconnected so it's even getting worse let's say complexity grows <coughs> and we have so-called standard APIs IPMI was um, was brought to life in 1999 from by Intel and others have followed but uh, if you look at the IPMI installation or the, the implementation of different vendors and I think one can include both too. Um, it differs. So it's not if you have a heterogeneous cluster, then um, it's very hard to have a common MPM, IPMI um, access. And SNMP is the same. Uh, various vendors have various implementations of their data structures, and uh, it's hard to give to have a, a common sense of of handling these errors and if someone try or someone decides to change his data structure then he will screw too. Um, dependencies, so if you want to to uh, detect an error in your LDAP server by an SNMP trap that is that relies on the same LDAP server then uh, you might be screwed because uh, this couldn't work. So SNMP is uh, in v v3 it's uh, it's called secure because you can uh, use ldap and you can uh, use sophisticated uh, um, passwords uh, but in my experience it's uh, mostly a simple password that is set because on the lowest level you won't interconnect to other <coughs> services to, um, uh, to to not depend on them if they fail so if you want to to monitor or to to um, supervise the lowest level, then you won't connect the lowest level to higher levels, and uh, this won't be done. So let's uh, have a look at the monitoring. So the current or the, the earliest versions of, of, of those were, I think, query reply structures where you have one monitoring master, one cons can call it Nagios here, uh, and you have a different or a variety of, n of nodes and with uh, some services. For example, here I have only three with three services, and one service is in the warning state, the others are fine, and uh, what the Nagios master does, he queries everyone and says, okay, what's your status? And they reply, green, except the service two or node one, and you have to ingest or digest every status and filter out this one that uh, has an error. So this is done by Nagios, so you don't have to worry, but if you have a pattern, so let's say this service has a, a, a pattern that it raises a bit and then it, it gets an error and this is um, done every couple of minutes or every couple of hours or regularly, then uh, you couldn't know at the second peak uh, that there is a pattern because you don't get the history of all the values that are introduced by this service. And this was, so here this is a peak. Um, that was, that was handled by, by Nagios or, or others to extend the reply to be a little bit richer, let's say, and introduce a very ugly time series database picture. I'm uh, not the artist, sorry. Which uh, will give you the same status, okay, or one in this case, and it will enrich us with uh, the values that leads to this, or other values can be included, but let's suppose it's a value that leads to this. And this will be inserted into the time series database. In uh, Nagios case, it was uh, RD tool. 
with the timestamp, and therefore you can get um, a graph plotted out of these values, and you can see that there is a pattern, and a human could easily um, see this this error pattern and say, okay, wait, there is maybe there is I saw something in the matrix, let's say. Um, one big issue with Nagios, in my opinion, is or in my experience is that the, the accessibility is quite uh, difficult. If you have 10 nodes or 50 mm. nodes or maybe 100 <coughs> nodes, it might be okay with a couple of services. But uh, if you have, like in our case, 4,000 nodes with, I, th I think in the total about 30,000 uh, services, and there is one error that leads to other errors, then, uh, yeah, then you're, you could not see this. It's, uh, it's impossible to, to, to um, access this. There are, what we have done, we, we used a pipe. Uh, there is a, some API that you can query to, to script Nagios, but it's not commonly, or it's not common use. And uh, yeah, we script our way around it to, for instance, if one rack was uh, into maintenance, then we have to, uh, to set every node to a state, okay, he's in maintenance. And this could be done by mouse, but if there are 40 nodes, 50 nodes, you, do, you will do it one time, and then you say, okay, there has to be another way because it's impossible to, to do this by mouse. And even if you're having uh, 100 nodes that are in maintenance, then you said, okay, we, we have to do something. And th therefore, a colleague of mine scripted a uh, little tool that, you, uh, that enables you to say, okay, node 100 to 500 are in maintenance now, and therefore it was usable again. But still, the um, the error related to another error is uh, hard to tackle. There is a parent um, architecture in Nagios, but uh, it has its problems too. I think. And you have also uh, on the website of Nagios, I found this. So you have also the possibility to get alerts. Usually, it's an email, or uh, you can use something else, but Problem with these alerts is if there are, is one alert that uh, is a false positive, you might say, okay, this one is, is fine. But uh, as you see in the in normal case, you have 100 emails that's claiming something is failing. And then the administrator says, okay, after the second or the third email, oh, where's this filter function again? And then everything will be marked as a read and dumped to dev zero and out of null. And then uh, you never see this error again. And uh, this is an issue, let's say. And uh, because it's looked like this, uh, Nagio say, hey, and you say, what? And then the Nagio said, okay, the disk SDA is critical and you don't care about disk SDA, it's 4, a 4 a.m. So um, you won't consider this an issue which causes you to wake up. So the accessibility and the responses that Nagios uh, gives you are not as optimal as it could be. But for the for the, for the job to be done in this time, it was uh, totally suitable because uh, what normally would wants, or what the user wants was uh, having one state or one site he can look at and see that everything is fine. So if you have a small cluster, then you might operate it um, that you will have, or you want to see everything green, and if it's not green, then you will uh, work as long as it takes to keep it green. So the normal state should be everything is green. And when you have the exception that something is red, then you will work on that. But if you grow to 5,000, 10,000, or what the future will bring, 20,000, or like the first, uh, the, the top one we saw yesterday, 16,000 nodes, then you could not say everything should be green um, because it won't be. You know, it will, will be an exception and you will pop up champagne if everything is green and it's a 60,000 node cluster. So, this is the exception and not the rule anymore. So, uh, future challenges or current challenges, uh, one could say. Uh, first, it's cats versus cattle. This, this phrase rings a bell, somebody? Yes, one, more, two, so a couple of them. Um, this describes, let's say, for instance, we have a forgotten prototype that became the central infrastructure, someone scripts a uh, fancy um, login script that everyone uses and this was done on his working working uh, working working workstation and everyone uses it but he doesn't know where it was and he don't care because it works but someone 
said, okay, oh, this workstation, oh, it's from the old uh, colleague that left two years ago. We can destroy it. And then the next day, everyone came to work and nothing works. And this is considered a cat because as he wrote, uh, as when he wrote it, uh, wrote it, uh, he, it was his pet, he raised it, he nursed it, he fiddled around and no one else was able or was, uh, was allowed to touch his cat because it was his. And uh, so it was not replaceable and uh, he has an emotional attach uh, attachment, I think, to, to this machine. And then uh, he forgot about it and uh, it was, was there. And, or this, um, you have a log file that grows and grows because you only pipe it and append it to the log and you saw the next day that it was too big and they say, okay, what we will do, we will do a loop and wait one day, so this is one day sleep, uh, 24 hours, and then we remove the log file and everything will be fine. But I think that could cause problems, let's say. Um, and uh, this is also considered a cat. It's, uh, okay, it's not that it's nursed long because only four uh, lines of bash script, I don't think that you have an emotional attachment to this, but <laughs> Yeah, uh, I think uh, in general we could say scripts or services or even uh, hardware. Or no, that's, a, that's a, another another thing. Or we have a script that reply on a specific format. Let's say we have uh, NFS in a certain uh, format, and uh, we monitor NFS uh, due to the parsing of this log. And then the, someone decides to change this format and then our whole login or monitoring infrastructure of NFS was screwed because this format was, um, yeah, was changed. And maybe it was some Perl script that someone wrote, which is unreadable after one day, and then you could not maintain the script, and this is considered a cat too. And I think if uh, you, you only have to think one minute or one second, and you have your own cats that you have um, in your infrastructure. So services, scripts, whatever that are not, um, not replaceable and that uh, has an emotional attachment to someone or that, yeah. I think you, 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 you are now you know what the cat is. Okay, let's come to the other part. Um, if we have a commodity hardware and we have a deterministic way to install it or a commodity way to install it, well, should, uh, it's, now it's bull, yeah? so it's uh, the bull supercomputing suite. And uh, you have some configuration on top of it that will also have a deterministic way to configure your services and not, re not place a, um, a shell script on top of the machine and runs it with this uh, remove mylock uh, um, um, my aim, uh, but have a puppet um, manifest that creates a, or copies a script and includes it in the cron job and this might be the way um, to install it. Because you can now swap off, uh, swap out the, the hardware, pop in another one, and it will be installed in the same fashion as the previous one. So this is considered a herd, uh, it's considered a kettle. And uh, a kettle, because it has an, uh, an ID here and not a name, you don't have a, a personal Emotion when you when you slaughter it because you want to eat it or maybe it's old and you say okay Let's replace it and this is this is not cute little cow. It's a little cow so um, Yeah, you can change and you can replace and you can even scale your herd in terms of getting new cows and put them into your uh, on the grass and you don't uh, Have an emotional attachment to them. So this is considered cattle and this is a term, herding cats versus herding cattle, and uh, with big clusters, or even with little clusters, but little clusters could, could be cats, but in big clusters you, you will fail if you have too much, too much cats, and you should uh, have cattle instead. Okay, so uh, monitoring API, um, as I talked about the layers, um, in the future or even today, we, ne we need to connect the layers. So if we have these different services and different <coughs> scripts, um, we need to have a central monitoring that uh, digests every information and um, helps it uh, easily accessible. Uh, maybe in the future it will uh, predict on this or 
apply machine learning or whatever, but first I think we, we have to have the data that we can, that can data mine and we can uh, work with. <coughs> So uh, one of uh, these APIs that is very fruitful and very uh, viral in the community is Graphite. It's a framework to handle metrics, as they call this. So metric is just the key value and the timestamp. So it could be this load one uh, with a value like two and the timestamp of the current um, of the current date. This will be pushed to a metric cache, and there are many ways to, to push it. Could be a UDP or TCP string or send to a socket, or we will see this. And this metric cache will cache it as it is a cache. So he will uh, has uh, he will populate a hash table which uh, has on one side as the key the key and as a as a value uh, a list of uh, tuples which includes the timestamp and the the value. So you have a time series database uh, in RAM and. If the RAM is, uh, is too small or you decide to have a, a permanent um, saving or permanent storage, then the metric cache will periodically flash this information to disk uh, using a, a called whisper format. So it's using a simple RRD format. <laughs> and the metric cache is all not only to, to push the, um, the metrics to it because without accessing them, it's not uh, of use. So there is a pull mechanism too, so a query mechanism where you, where you can query information and uh, display them or use them in scripts or, um, use, or use them, do other, other stuff with them. So um, what could be uh, um, a metric that is pushed to this or how it's pushed to this is uh, very simple. You have um, just an echo with a string. So this is the key is test.test1 with a random int number and the current date as a Unix epoch. And this is sent to the port 2003 on the local host. And uh, as you can see, I, I had a loop that will run to, the, to infinity, sleep five seconds, and send every five seconds a random number to my uh, beloved metric cache. And uh, this could be... Uh, or this could be received as a simple uh, query to to uh, the to to the cache, uh, where I just describe, okay, I want this uh, key I just used, and I want it the last ten seconds of it, and I want to have it as a JSON format, and uh, use some JSON uh, pretty print to to uh, show it, and this is what what will come back. So it's just. Um, there's the two uh, points I just inserted and uh, the description of the, of the key. But okay, uh, command line interfaces are fine, uh, but it's more common to have a UI too. So this is a UI, or this is only the picture that is rendered by the UI um, uh, that you can easily access. And uh, I will show a demo at the end if there's time, and I think we might have some time. Okay, so we are in ah, monitoring context, so let's have the same service we have before, node 1, service 2, and we don't know what this means. Um, but we have uh, not also metrics in our, uh, uh, in our monitoring infrastructure, we also push events to it. So let's say the job scheduler will push an event when a job starts, he will push an event when a job fails, he will push an event if the return code is something weird, or uh, every other service could also send events, then you can overlay the events to the metric and say, okay, here is, a, um, you see the, the job start is um, at the very beginning of this, uh, of this included, or this, um, this error that is, that error rate that is uh, raised, and uh, this will help you a lot, and this will reduce the uh, time to fix the error, not only by the factor of two, but maybe by the factor of uh, yeah, epsilon. Or is it very, you, will, you will be very fast, because you can connect the dots. And if this UI, as it is in Graphite, is very easy to handle, then the administrator is able to, yeah, to be very speedy, very fast, and could not only uh, use templates that are foreseen by the uh, developers 
to errors that are in the wild, but he can also dive into the monitoring system and uh, browse it it's himself, which is, I think, the very most, uh, very, very much better than just have templates that are done in the lab and you're in the wild, they will be completely different to what is in the lab. So it should be very browsable. Okay, so half an hour. Now we come to the Q&A, but I would like to start first with a question from me to you. So um, what do you use? Who uses suggests a simply uh, query reply scheme I uh, showed first? So just the Nagios without the performance add-on to just see the green dots and only the green dots. No one? Yeah, kind of. Okay. Ah, okay, that's, uh, that's nice. And the rich reply version where you have a performance. Or oh, let's first start maybe with who uses Nagios, let's say. Ah, okay, yeah, that's a smarter question for, for starters. And uh, so one is using just a simple reply and the rest of you are using the performance plugin which stores it in the RRD tool. Yeah? No? Someone else? Well, what, what do you use? use Gangly for the performance part. And if we want to, can we connect Ganglia and Nagios so that we monitor the thresholds that come in from Ganglia, and then we can set alerts based on that. Okay. We disable the alerts in Nagios itself, but just see whatever thresholds we need from Ganglia and use that for pushing all the metrics. Okay. And Okay, and uh, but uh, Ganglia, I'm sorry, is uh, using Postgres or is it using RD? Using RD, using RD tool, but uh, there's RD cache inside. So okay. It scares. It scares very well. We've come to. We've in, in, in a specific scenario, we've gone to tens of thousands of nodes. Okay, with a lot of services too. Then. It, yes, it saves an RD per metric per host, so we have a lot of RD, so we can get a lot of I/O, but. You can scale it to tens of thousands of hosts with dozens of metrics per host if you use either EMPFS or now RD cache which pretty much makes EMPFS obsolete so as a solution for this problem. But uh, it's not possible to to compare different metrics, right? So you inherent from the UI. I mean, you can overlay jobs. Okay. And connect it with whatever scheduler you're using, it's or whatever. Okay. And you can compare. Metrics, you can compare hosts, you can create your custom aggregate hosts and compare those. There's, you can export it to JSON, you okay. can integrate with Graphite if you really want to. Ah, okay, that's it's what I love. Graphite is good. Okay. And, but yeah, it covers everything. Okay, so, Anglia? Something else who one would like to mention? So uh, ganglia is what I what I miss here. So Nagia, so in Chinga or Chinkan, so ganglia we I should add. And uh, how much layers do you measure? How do, you, do you measure everything from the very low level network traffic to the job scheduler to different events to NFS, whatever? So we go, we go up to, we use the, the GPFS idea. Okay. GPFS uh, with CNFS, and we use a cluster of those machines that export the fastest to the FSO. They're, they're like <coughs> the glue between the JBOTs and, and the NFS that they export. So there's a lot, and, and it's distributed. In some cases, we have a lot of such nodes. So, um, so it's very important to us to manage your NFS SOPs mm -hmm. and compare those with GPFS SOPs, which they don't necessarily translate specifically. There's a lot of caching layers in the middle. So we go to out to each one of the nodes. We we have a script that just dumps all of the NFS ops that that node is doing, NFS client ops. We aggregate that across all the nodes. Mm -hmm. We have a picture coming down from the hosts themselves, and we have a picture coming from the GPFS nodes, and we can compare and overlay those. It's actually all out of the box, so we don't have to do other work. It's cool. Maybe inside Gandhi, mm -hmm. and it's open source. Okay. Yeah, nice. Nice, nice. Uh, yeah, so, Ganglia. I will show graphite and I don't know. I think uh, it will outperform, but we'll see. 
So um, the other question, I already told at that end. Um, I first, my, or let's say my first Python project uh, or bigger Python, Python project was a, a tool that includes um, monitoring of, uh, of uh, the growth of data in a lot of uh, NFS shares around the data center. So it was, one could say it was, would be a job for, uh, for Ron Robin, or no, Robin Hood it was called, so, but this uh, was not able to, to have the history. So we decided, for whatever reason, we decided to, to do it ourselves from scratch. Uh, I had a little Python script that uses, uh, I think it was DU, had a, with a handbrake, so it does not uh, put too much burden on the, on the file system. And it was, so the gathering of the information was quite easy. But I was um, forced to use uh, a self-made <coughs> product, uh, which was a transport layer. So it was a very, it was a cat, let's say. Uh, it started like a cat. Uh, and um, I used this. And there I encountered RD tool and, or the, let's say, the, 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 the unintuitive pain you have with RD tool. So with RD tool, you have a time slot where you have to send data. And if you don't send it in the particular uh, time slot, then it will uh, apply some magic and predict different values. So if you have uh, one, two, three send, and on the time step that is half, you, you send uh, three, then it will predict it to some magic that I, uh, I, I, yeah, I, I don't like, or maybe you can turn it off, but in my case, it was uh, very ugly. And um, yeah, this was it starts as a cute, no, a cute cat, and it, it evolves to a very ugly pet, because uh, I was the only one that was meant to, to know it, because I was the only one to develop it, and every once in a while, there was a problem, because my Postgres Postgres database was uh, screwed or the service was not on. And so it's a couple of years ago, but uh, it's a very painful memory. And uh, oh, two years later, there were people coming to me, oh, here's this file system monitoring. This is your fault and you have to do it. Mm -hmm. So yeah, this was where I encountered RD tool and maybe I'm influenced by this uh, <laughs> memory that I don't, that dislike RD tool. Uh, so, Maybe. And graphite, uh, I think, uh, will challenge it. And I think we have 10 minutes at the end that I can show it for, for, to you. Um, yeah. And one thing I really didn't like about RD tool is that you, once you send a metric or once you set a value at the, at the timestamp now, then you cannot change the past. So if uh, you have different ways of, uh, of sources that are throwing to your RD tool, uh, server or your, your, your file system where the RD tool or RD file uh, is located, then uh, you, you, once someone writes the timestamp, then you can change the path. So this is kind of, uh, I think it was kind of ugly. And uh, it's also maybe Ganglia, I don't know where, how, how Ganglia does it, but it's not easy to overlay two metrics to one file. So what normally is done or what I've seen is that you, if you have one rack and you have ten servers and every server has a RD file, and you want to com you want to aggregate this to an RD file or you want to aggregate this to a metric uh, for this rack, then there will be a little script that creates a new RD file for the rack, and this uh, houses every metric for this uh, some ten servers and aggregates it in some fashion, and then you have this RD file for the server uh, for the all the servers. And uh, this is uh, kind of uh, not real time, and it's uh, kind of hard. And I don't know. Do you know how, how Ganglia do, does it with RD cache? Or exactly the way it's <laughs> <laughs> okay. So I got you. Ganglia is not good. I think. <laughs> uh, yes. No. <laughs> that's that's a good one. I like this. I have a second.